Um, so this talk is going to be a little bit technical, a little bit high level. Hopefully there'll be a little bit of humor in there. Ultimately that depends on kind of individuals' tastes. But uh, I'm hoping there'll be something for everyone today. Speak up. All right, speak up. Can I volume up as well? Um, so, um, yeah, so this, this talk is in particular for people who are in any way involved in software development. If you are a developer yourself, or you are in, on a security response team for a company, or you're a consultant for a company that does software, there'll be probably some relevant takeaways for you today. Um, everyone okay with the sound levels at the back? Can everyone hear me okay? Cool. All right. Uh, so to start with, I am going to start with a story. So on the 7th of September, 2017, my colleague Mo uh, found a vulnerability in the Spring framework. Now this vulnerability was in, uh, related to what's called the Spring expression language or spell, which is a type of uh, language that can be used internally in Spring to access certain bits of information. Now the vulnerability occurs when we uh, treat incoming user data as an expression that we evaluate, um, which gives rise to a remote code execution. Now this particular vulnerability was a remote code execution which allowed any user or any visitor to your website to craft a HTTP request to effectively run any uh, command they want on your server. Um, this particular vulnerability actually required two um, uh, requests in sequence, but you could still run anything you wanted. So Mo reported the uh, vulnerability to uh, Pivotal. Um, and on the 21st of September, Pivotal released a patch that fixed the vulnerability. Um, they also uh, got a CVE allocated for it and made an announcement. Now, the day after that, my uh, colleague took a look at the patch, realized it wasn't really a patch, didn't really fix the vulnerability. Um, and he updated his exploit to take a slightly different code path and still trigger the RCE and send that information to Pivotal. A few days after that, uh, Pivotal, um, this time rather than going ahead and pub pub publishing it straight away, he, they privately sent a, the details of the patch to Mo for him to verify whether or not it was actually complete. The next day, Mo discovered it was incomplete and sent an updated exploit to Pivotal. It was at this point they decided that their approach wasn't really working um, and decided to actually refactor that part of the code base to significantly reduce the chances of those sorts of mistakes happening. And then on the 25th of October, they actually released their final patch, which did address the vulnerability properly. Let me tell you a different story. Also about uh, some vulnerabilities. So on the 27th of April, 2016, there was a CVE in Apache Struts 2 that was announced. And this CVE works similarly to the ones uh, previously in Spring. Um, what happened here is Apache have this language called OGNL, which works similar to Spell, which uh, is supposed to be predominantly used internally for an application and not exposed to the user. The vulnerability arised when uh, Apache was treating user data as an expression and evaluating it allowing the user to run anything they wanted on the Struts server. On the 12th of May, 2016, less than a month later, a new RCE was discovered that uh, was triggered by interpreting user data as OGNL. On the 20th of June, 2016, a new CVE was discovered and announced that uh, arises when user data is treated as an OGNL expression. On the 19th of March, 2017, an RCE was announced because they were treating user data as an OGNL expression. And again, on the 22nd of September, this time, three separate reports, I believe, from a couple of former names you see earlier on in the timeline. Um, another RCE, another code path, interpreting user data as OGNL. And then on the 24th of September, my coworker Mo, who discovered the vulnerability on the previous slide, reported a new RCE to Apache 
which treats user data as OGNL. And there's only so much room I have on my slide, but this actually isn't the complete list of remote code execution vulnerabilities due to interpreting user data as OGNL. These five CVEs are just some of the other ones that do that. Um, and it might seem like I'm potentially picking on Pivotal or Apache here, but I'm really not. This is something that is quite systemic throughout all of software development. Anyone that has done any large uh, software project um, that has had a significant user base probably feels uh, some recognition uh, with, the, with these two stories. So we're, we're kind of playing the game of whack-a-mole like this cat is here. We're seeing something come up and we're like rushing to fix it and then get it out the door and repaired. And then it pops its head up again and then we fix it again and so on and so forth. Um, this isn't really great. <laughs> Uh, the, more, the more that we do this, the more we're sort of like reacting and responding to things, the less we're actually able to focus on properly securing things. So how can we solve this? How do we like prevent the fires from starting rather than just trying to put them out when we notice them? Well, what if we use the information of these new vulnerabilities as they come in as an opportunity instead? What if when a new mistake is discovered, you know, we, we say to ourselves, I wonder if this mistake is happening anywhere else, and we try and find to see where those mistakes are. Once you've found the root cause of the vulnerability. So there could, for example, be something architecturally that means that uh, a, certain class is more, a certain class of vulnerability is more likely to happen for your application. Your use of C, for example, might increase your chances of having memory corruption issues. Using something like Apache OGNL or Spring Expression Language may make you more vulnerable to RCE uh, vulnerabilities over HTTP. So you should try and find some of the mistakes, and the chances are that you will find something. And companies such as Google and Microsoft, who have been doing this for a while now, uh, call this process variant analysis. So this is a quote from um, a blog post by Stephen Hunter of the Microsoft Security Response Center who deal with a lot of Microsoft's incoming vulnerability reports and triaging and, and getting the fixes out. And he says, after doing root cause analysis, our next step is variant analysis, finding and investigating any variants of the vulnerability. It's important that we find all such variants and patch them simultaneously, otherwise we bear the risk of these being exploited in the wild. So it's a stage of their vulnerability response process that happens before making details of a vulnerability or patch public so that they can patch the original vulnerability and all of the variants simultaneously. Because if they don't do this, once the patch is released, other people will take it upon themselves to find variants of these vulnerabilities and if possible, exploit them. And they, they know this all too well. So how do you actually perform variant analysis? How do you take a known vulnerability and find other variants of it? Well, to be honest, um, until recently, most of the big players have predominantly been relying on a lot of manual work um, by security response teams to try and find variants. Focusing on particularly sensitive areas of the code base where vulnerabilities are more likely to show up. Uh, manually checking how data flows throughout the application using techniques like looking at the control flow, which is you know, looking at conditionals, seeing under what conditions sit certain parts of the code execute. Looking at uh, data flow, like tracking data flowing through the application through variable assignments, through function calls, et cetera. And doing stuff like range analysis, looking at the number of the certain values that a particular um, variable can take and seeing if the bounds are being checked correctly, stuff like that. Um, one of the most important tools for doing this, um, uh, basic text search tools like grep or AWK. Um, something that comes in extremely handy as well uh, are IDEs that have a much more um, broader, or much better understanding of the language you're dealing with, where they have uh, call graphs, you can do jump to def definition, you can uh, look at references. It really helps you jump around the stack, jump around the call graph, and track data as it flows them as you do uh, manual analysis. Now, you might be thinking, this sounds like a lot of work. Um, you wouldn't be wrong. Um, doing a lot of manual analysis can be pretty difficult, yet it hasn't 
necessarily stopped these companies in the past doing exactly that, putting a lot of man hours into trying to find these things. And effectively, that's what companies like, uh, or what organizations like Project Zero are doing. They, they have some tools like fuzzing and stuff, but a lot of what they're looking at is just manually looking at the code, trying to understand it and see if it's doing something dodgy. So could we do anything better than this? I mean, it's repetitive and time consuming, requires lots of iterative exploration. You know, you're clicking through function after function after function to see where the data goes. And it's obviously prone to human error. Now, the more complex the mistake is that you're looking for, or the larger the code base, or the closer the deadline that you need to know um, whether there are any other mistakes by is, like, the more likely it is that something will get missed, that there'll be a vulnerability that remains undiscovered. It's also not scalable. As the size of a code base increases, manually checking for a class of vulnerability every single time a new one is discovered becomes completely infeasible particularly as security, uh, uh, application security teams are often like so much smaller than the, uh, the development teams. And finally, as your list of mistakes that you're finding, the list, list of classes of mistakes that you're finding grows over time, the list of things you need to remember or your developers need to remember to check at code review also increases. And so the code review process will just become completely um, slow and painful or in, and insufficient uh, if you do that. And to be honest, developers will mostly, I mean, I certainly don't check every single thing I need to remember whenever I do code review. Um, so what can you do? If variant analysis is critical for you, if it's really necessary to find all of the vulnerabilities um, coming in, and yet doing so is infeasible, can we automate it somehow? What if there is a way that we could describe a mistake that allows um, us to automatically find other instances of that same mistake throughout our code? A mistake that describes, a description that includes how data flow should look or how different parts of the code are related to each other, including semantic information. What we could do then is we could run it across the entire code base, we could run it across multiple code bases, and we could even run it in the future to prevent reoccurrences of these mistakes? Well, it turns out that there are a few tools that allow you to do exactly that. So for example, Clang Tidy, um, which is part of the Clang compiler, allows you to extend it with certain rules to um, catch things at compile time. Um, it, and you can include both semantic and syntactic information in those rule sets. Linters as well are increasingly um, including more and more semantic information to be used in their rule sets so that you can specify um, restrictions on what the code should look like. There are also uh, a number of technologies that are emerging that allow you to write queries to look for things over source code. Um, and my company is, is one such company that provides a solution. Um, but I'm not gonna go into a detailed comparison in this talk. Um, I just want you to know that these tools exist and people are starting to use them. Um, and I'm gonna show you how so um, next on the agenda is I'm gonna show you a example uh, from that same Microsoft blog post that I quoted from earlier of um, how they uh, wrote a, um, a semantic code query to look for a mistake. So this is some example code from Chakra, which is the JavaScript engine behind Edge. Um, and it also powers a bunch of the other Windows applications that are in JavaScript. So this C++ function uh, on the screen is something that's made available and can be called from within JavaScript. So they found a vulnerability here that I'm gonna, I'm gonna run through uh, and explain to you. Um, so the first thing that this function does is it looks at one of the arguments that's passed to it and it assigns the uh, pointer or the, the address and the size of a block of memory that represents a JavaScript array buffer. And it assigns them to two variables, uh, p buffer and buffer size. Following that, the next thing it does is it calls a function where it tries to calculate the integer value of the second argument that's passed to it. Now the way that it does this is um, it, by calling the value of method of the object that's passed to it. Now in JavaScript, it's possible to overwrite the value of method of an object to run your own code. So we could potentially 
be running any arbitrary JavaScript code um, with this function call. So for example, you could, in that overridden method, decide to free the array buffer so that p buffer becomes a dangling pointer. And then at that point, when you try and use the pointer, uh, you have a memory corruption issue. Now, when uh, Microsoft were assessing this vulnerability, um, they decided it was uh, critical. They pretty uh, easily created an exploit that managed to crash the browser. Um, and it was their suspicion that it wouldn't take much more effort to create a full code execution vulnerability with this. This is an example, an illustrative example of what the JavaScript exploit looked like. You can see that we have an array buffer at the top there. Um, we are creating a value of function for this object um, that frees the buffer and then calling the vulnerable function later on. So Microsoft found this vulnerability and they, they diagnosed it, they, they found the root cause. But they wanted to know whether they had any similar things elsewhere in the code base. They wanted to know if a similar mistake had been made elsewhere. So, um, so they, as part of the variant analysis process, wrote a query for it. So this is what the query looked like. I modified it a little bit to make sure that it completely fit on the slide. Um, yeah. So anyone that's interacted with any database systems before, written any query like SQL or something, will find some pretty similar constructs here. So firstly, we have a from statement that uh, lists all the relations that we're interested in looking at. And remember that we're treating code as data here, so we're actually, it's a database of code. So in this case, we're looking at variables, assignments to uh, array buffer pointers, um, function calls, and accesses to variables. And accesses are both reads and writes to variables in a local scope. We have a where condition that lists uh, what the requirements are for things to be output from the query. And then we have a select clause that lists all the different uh, columns that we're interested in outputting. Jumping into the where condition here, line four uh, effectively ensures that the pointer assignment and the variable use later on are talking about the same variable. So I'd make sure here that p buffer and p buffer at the top and the bottom are both the same variable. Line six ensures that the function is a function that may execute JavaScript. Now, rather than enumerating every single function in Chakra that could call JavaScript, there are lots of them, as you can imagine, it's a JavaScript interpreter. Um, the security researchers were aware that every single function that does this may eventually call this function called method called to primitive. So here they say um, the, the, the restriction is that call, the function call, needs to be a call to a function that eventually calls method to primitive, method called primitive. So it's either a function that calls that, or it's a function that calls a function that calls that, or a function that calls a function that calls a function that calls that, and so on. So yeah, that's referring to this call here. And then the last two conditions uh, simply say that um, the call to the function must happen after the definition here. So the f definition must come first, and then the call to the function must happen later on. And then uh, the use of the, the p, p buffer variable must happen after the call to the function so that we can be sure it's at a point where it might be a memory corruption issue. So in the blog post, uh, Stephen Hunter said that when they ran this query, they were able to find, in addition to the original vulnerability, four more instances of the same mistake being made elsewhere in the Chakra code, all of which were classified as critical vulnerabilities. So you were then able to patch all of, them, all of them at the same time and release a single new version with a single announcement um, and have pretty good confidence that there won't be similar mistakes elsewhere. So that, that example was pretty specific to um, the Chakra code base. You might, for example, be able to do something similar for other JavaScript engines like V8 or um, what Gecko use, um, what Mozilla use for Firefox. Um, 
But there are definitely kinds of mistakes that are a lot more general than that. For example, you might have a mistake that many people make that might be a misuse of a language feature. Or you might have a mistake um, that comes from a misunderstanding of how an API works or a framework. And in those cases, you can actually go a step further in, as well as like writing some, or just writing some description for a, mis for a mistake and using it yourself, you can then share that, make that open source, make it available to the world so that security teams and developers from other organizations or open source developers can take advantage of the research that you've had and the mistakes that you've made. So I'm gonna talk about another story. Um, oh, before I do that, I have a couple of bullet points. Um, first one's what I said, second one, in addition to, of course, sharing your own knowledge, you can use the knowledge that other people are sharing. If there's a security research team from Microsoft and you're at Google, for example, and Microsoft published something, you can then use that um, to check your own code to see if you're making similar mistakes to the ones that they have. All right, now I'm gonna talk about another story. So who here has heard of ZipSlip? A couple, two, three. So this is an interesting vulnerability class. Um, Back in June of 2018, a company called SNCC, who does a dependency analysis to make sure that dependencies that you're running are up to date and don't have any vulnerabilities, they found a worryingly large number of mistakes being made that all seem to kind of be the same mistake. So like any good vulnerability, they designed a logo for it. And went, uh, put a lot of effort into trying to find as many places that they can in like high impact projects and disclose them before making the public announcement. So I'm gonna quickly explain what the vulnerability was. So who here has ever written any code that uh, extracts an archive? One, two, three, four, okay, a bunch of you. Um, so the way the zip files work uh, are they're effectively a list of file paths paired with the contents of those files. Now, file paths are simply strings. They're just, they're just some text. Um, there isn't actually any more structure than that in zip files. So when you have directories in zip files, it's, um, they don't really exist. And they're not, it's not really a tree-like structure. It's just a list. So what that means is um, you, uh, in these paths, you actually have like slashes, like um, path components. Uh, what that also means is you could potentially put um, path traversal path components in there, such as dot dot slash. Now, who's familiar with what dot dot slash does? Cool. It goes to the parent directory, right? So you might start to feel where this is going. Um, if you are not careful and you're trying to unzip a zip file, when you join the destination directory with the path name from the entry, the parent traversals will collapse and unzip the files to outside of your destination. You could, for example, uh, if, you, if you are unzipping a potentially malicious zip file, um, it may be able to override important user or system files, insert shell scripts, reconfigure things. Um, for example, anyone here use Ansible for configuration? A few people. Um, Ansible, you may, you know, a common use case might be running as a root user on a target machine that you're installing some packages on. Um, you may um, decide to unzip a zip file from a third party which could potentially be malicious um, and may actually override important system files there. So Ansible were one of the projects that actually had this vulnerability. So this is some example Java code that's vulnerable to zip slip. Um, the problematic line is this one here where you're basically joining the destination path to the path of a particular entry. Um, and as there's no sanitization, as you're not checking at all uh, the contents of the path, this could potentially go anywhere. So 
after um, SNCC made this announcement, Microsoft uh, were curious to see if they were making this mistake anywhere. You might be sensing a theme here. Um, Microsoft like queries. So they wrote a query. Um, they wrote a query for C-sharp that checks whether any of their C-sharp code um, potentially does something like this. And the, the basic description of the mistake was find places where data flows from the path of an entry to an I.O. operation. Um, pretty simple conceptually. Um, unsurprisingly, they found a number of vulnerabilities in a bunch of their projects across their portfolio that were handling zip files in an unsafe manner. After they fixed a bunch of them, uh, they decided to then open source this query because it is a very general purpose query. Anyone that's handling zip files at all or any application that's handling zip files at all could potentially be vulnerable. Uh, so they open sourced it um, and basically contributed it to this uh, central repository of, uh, of queries uh, and automated checks for mistakes that have come up in the past. Um, my company went and wrote a few more of these queries for other languages, um, and we found a bunch of vulnerabilities in a few dozen open source projects, uh, op large open source projects that we um, responsibly disclosed to. So, that's variant analysis. Um, now, you may be wondering, you know, I've, I've talked a bit about how it works, why it's important, um, but next is like, how can you actually use this as an organization? You might be a security researcher, or you might be a developer, or, or you might be um, CSO or some other uh, manager, and you need to know how, to, how, how you can actually use this. So, for now, I'm going to assume that you already have a security, uh, a workflow in place for dealing with vulnerabilities. So you, you might get a vulnerability through pen testing, through a bug bounty, through some audit, through something else, and you need to deal with it. That, that vulnerability might be known by someone outside. It might be known by a malicious party. Um, it might be known by the person that reported it to you who could be external to the organization, and you need to deal with that as soon as possible. So you look at the root cause. You understand what's happening. You then fix that vulnerability and uh, release it, release the patch. So the most natural place for variant analysis to fit in would be after you have discovered or after you've diagnosed what the root cause is. So at this point, you can use using your platform of choice um, and just, just describe the mistake in a way that allows you to automatically check if that mistake is being made anywhere else. You can then see what results come up. Um, it's likely for the first few times that you try this, there'll be a lot of false positives. Uh, and things that you didn't really consider in describing your mistake. Um, so you iterate, you improve the query, see what results come up until you've got a, a small enough number of results that you can kind of look through it manually. Discover what potential variants you have at that point, fix them, and really it should be at this point that you deploy your fix. Wait until you have fairly good certainty that you've covered all of the instances of that same mistake. Going beyond this, now that you've written um, an automated check, you can actually start running this continuously. Um, potentially, uh, just before making a release of your software, you might want to check, see, have I got any new problems uh, or any new instances of, of that problem we found a couple of years ago? You can, you can check, you can, you can see if that's the case. Even better than that, you might incorporate this as part of your code review process. If, you are, um, if your organization uses something like GitHub or Bitbucket or GitLab, you could uh, incorporate this so that for every single code contribution, you can check whether that contribution introduces a mistake that you're already familiar with. And then, of course, you can fix it before it even becomes part of your code base. And then, going a step beyond this, once you've, written, um, once you've written some automated checks for some mistakes, open source it, share it with the world. Um, allow other security teams and other development teams to benefit from your own mistakes, benefit from your knowledge. And then finally, incorporate other people's knowledge as well. 
So maybe you don't have a vulnerability response process. Maybe uh, you might be part of a very small software startup that's only just getting off the ground. You might not have released a product yet. Um, you might be working on an open source project, a pretty small one. Well, the first thing to understand is that sooner or later, you probably will be faced with a situation where you need to deal with a vulnerability. And it's probably a good idea to have an idea of how you would go about doing that when the time comes. But in the meantime, until you do have to deal with a vulnerability, I would highly recommend using some free automated tools to check your code. Use all of this knowledge that's being continuously published and added to. Um, MSRC have some great blog posts detailing the sorts of mistakes they're dealing with, which is um, really fascinating. So um, I'm running through this quite quickly. I'm, I'm very aware that everyone is eager to get onto the after party. So there's only a couple of slides left, but I just want to finish up with just talking a bit about what variant analysis is not. Variant analysis is not a replacement for good security architecture. For example, if you're facing uh, a lot of different uh, memory corruption issues in your C application, maybe consider migrating to Rust. I would not uh, argue against that. If you are seeing lots of vulnerabilities caused by evaluating user data as certain kinds of expressions, maybe don't use those expressions. Maybe don't use OGNL or Spell. If you're seeing lots of SQL injection vulnerabilities, maybe switch to a database library that does auto-escaping for you. Variant analysis is not a replacement for exploit mitigation. Please, please use technologies like address space layout randomization. You want to make it as hard as possible for when an attacker gets a vulnerability or finds an exploit, you want to make it as hard as possible for them to do anything with it. So use address space layout randomization. Use things like AppArmor on Linux, et cetera, et cetera. Variant analysis is not a replacement for existing security practices. It does not replace fuzzing. I would highly encourage you to, if you're doing fuzzing, to continue doing fuzzing and add variant analysis to it. It's actually a complement. You can find something, you can find a vulnerability with fuzzing, look at the root cause of the vulnerability, and then describe it, the mistake and find more of those mistakes. You know, it, it works pretty well together. It's not a replacement for having vulnerability disclosure and bug bounty programs. I also highly recommend that you, um, you do those, or you do research into whether those would be appropriate for your company. It's not a replacement for auditing your code. It's not a replacement for pen testing or doing red team exercises. It's not a replacement for unit tests. Um, if anything, results for variant analysis can often indicate that you need to add more unit tests. And variant analysis is not dependency monitoring. Um, something else that I would highly recommend that you do. There are many companies that offer this service, like Black Duck or SNCC or White Source, who will look at what code your code is using and ensure that all the versions are up to date or don't have any vulnerabilities. If anything, um, Variant analysis is actually something that will later feed, those, feed the information of those companies. It's a process that produces more CVEs. It checks your code, not the code of the libraries you're using. Um, variant analysis is not something that automatically fixes bugs for you or tells you how to fix them. It just points them out. You still need to put the effort into thinking about how you're going to solve something once something's been pointed out to you. To you. Um, there was one other thing that I forgot to add to the slide. Uh, never mind. I'm sure it might come to me later. Um, so to recap, do variant analysis. It's, it's very important, and all of the big players are starting to do it. Google's doing it. Mozilla's doing it. Um, uh, Microsoft is doing it. NASA is doing it. Large, uh, newer startups like Uber are doing it. Um, and I'm regularly hearing reports that people are finding around three to four times as many vulnerabilities as they were before they were doing it. 
And um, more importantly, or better yet, you should do automated variant analysis. Describe your mistakes in a way that some tool can automatically check for them. It reduces the, the labor, reduces the workload, and overall, um, you can, uh, many companies are actually finding their overall workload for their security response team is decreasing the more variant analysis they do because the number of vulnerabilities that are coming in that would have otherwise been caught through VA uh, is, is increased. Use and contribute to the shared knowledge and checks from security response teams. Um, open source your checks. Use open source checks. Everyone, we, we can't do this in isolation. There's not a single security research team that can think of every single type of attack vector that their software might be hit with. Learn from the knowledge of other people from other security research teams that have dealt with different situations that you have. Learn from the knowledge of your um, bug bounty um, submitters. Checks should be run continuously and not once off. Don't just think that doing variant analysis for a particular mistake once is good enough because people will probably make that mistake again in the future. Make sure it's part of your process to prevent new instances of these mistakes coming in. And finally, variant analysis complements and doesn't replace many of the existing security practices out there and indeed can actually reduce the overall workload when it's combined. So I'm finished about 15 minutes early. That's about all I have.